and I'm the vice president of the chapter of the New York chapter of Cornet. Thank you for uh, signing up. We have a lot of people here today. Um, our virtual content during times of COVID has kind of geared down a little bit since the summer, just out of uh, a Zoom exhaustion. We tried to pare it down a bit, but you know, our, the, the select events that we're doing now have been really impactful. So we're looking forward to another great panel. Uh, I'm gonna pass it off to Steven in a minute. As you saw, our uh, spon chapter sponsors were scrolling as we logged on. So a big thank you to all our sponsors who without them, this wouldn't be possible. So um, this is the second installment of the owner's rep consortium or whatever they're calling themselves these days. I'll let Steven and, and the panelists describe that. It should be a good event. And Steven's gonna go over some of the logistics <coughs> catch the event for you all. So thanks for joining. This event will be recorded. So if you miss anything, uh, it'll be distributed at a later date. So with that, I'll pass off to Stephen and enjoy the show. Right, thank you, Tommy. Um, welcome everyone to today's panel. For those who have not attended an SPP event before, unlike many other webinars, we strongly encourage audience participation on the chat and the Q&A. So to allow this to happen, we do not control your audio and visual. So if you don't want to appear as one of the panelists and to improve the experience for everyone on the call, please keep your audio and video turned off during the panel discussion, but share your thoughts and questions using the chat function. During the 20 minute Q&A at the end, Kirsten, our moderator, will invite individuals to turn on their audio and video and ask questions they have raised in the chat. Today's plugged in session titled, A Great Time to Build, But Be Prepared, was chosen before the very positive recent news about highly effective vaccines, but remains pertinent. With low occupancies enabling more straight time work, great deals to be had on letting space, and the design and construction teams looking to fill their pipeline, today's market offers a great opportunity for end users and landlords to make improvements if they design well, source well, and manage their risk every step of the way. Today, we're joined by four fellow members of the Owners Rep and Project Management, or RPM Alliance, all of whom are leaders of New York City's top project management firms. David Horowitz oversees the execution of interiors and building renovation projects in the metro area for Colliers. He also sits on SPP. Eric Wagner leads CBRE's project management practice across the tri-state area. Richard Jantz, a returning ORPM panelist, leads Cushman and Wakefield's project and development services group across the tri-state area. And finally, Kirsten Beck, who also joined our last ORPM panel, and today is acting as our moderator, is principal in charge of project management at Averson Young's New York City office. And with that, I will hand you over to Kirsten. Enjoy the panel and please get involved in the chat and the Q&A. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, you really do have that down pat now. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, today we've assembled uh, some of the best in owner's rep project management to discuss why this is a good time to design and build uh, commercial interiors and commercial capital improvements, if it makes sense for your organization. Um, as Stephen said, he, I, uh, Richard, David, and Eric are all members of a newly formed group uh, called the Owner's Rep Project Management Alliance, or ORPM. Uh, the purpose of the Alliance is to harness our collective expertise in order to provide clear consensus-based recommendations to the occupier, tenant, and end-user client constituents navigating challenging matters which affect the design and construction industries as a whole. The ORPM Alliance strives to be the trusted advisor to our collective clients, providing them with guidance and information so they can make informed decisions on solving problems and mitigating risk which is what we're here to talk about today. Uh, so as a reminder, please do submit your questions in the Q&A, uh, but now let's get started with our first question to Richard. So <clears throat> Richard, what are some of the considerations that clients are wrestling with around the future of workplace and whether a capital project should proceed in this current environment? 
Thank you, Kirsten. And I want to thank everybody again. I'm so pleased to be here and, and be able to address this group uh, of, of influences in, in our market. And, you know, as, as the regional lead for PM and as the remainder of the panel, you know, we all have collectively a front row seat to how real estate and project deliveries is trending. And, you know, I wanted to just to hit on a couple of issues. Interestingly, you know, we all hear about the exodus out of the new, out of the cities and the CBDs. We hear about uh, offices emptying out and the death of the office. And while these things grab headlines, they're just not the whole story. I was just on a, on a, a couple of discussions with the head of leasing for Brookfield and Nuveen yesterday. And they have very, very different looks into how their tenancies are uh, leasing up and using and thinking about space. Um, while they do see trends of, of uh, larger work from home or, or dispersed workforce, as we're starting to call it, uh, so taking up a little bit, this was a trend that was happening well before COVID. Um, and, uh, and the truth is right now, we are operating in a business landscape that's defined by heated and accelerated change. Um, but frankly, the city has lived through these changes before, and we're actually seeing the, the increase, potential increase in work from home being offset in some ways from a space uh, 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 footprint standpoint by the design for distancing. So we're almost seeing an evening out of the, of the need and the footprint of space, although we do see currently a trend in, uh, in the opposite direction of reducing that footprint a little bit. Um, you know, right now the, opp the opportunities are out there for those um, who can evolve with this change. Um, and, you know, we're starting to see really positive glimmers out there of activity and action. Um, first one is our capital markets group here at Cushman and Wakefield uh, have seen uh, and, and lenders have seen really meaningful increases in activity since the election. Um, that is really portending a positive move in 2021 of buildings trading and changing, and, and that always kind of fills our pipeline, which is really important. Um, our property conditions assessment and reporting team here um, is also seeing about a 200% increase in just the last 10 days of people looking to, and banks looking to understand those assets, uh, what the valuation are, what's the long-term prospects, and, re and, and, and uh, really understanding how that lending uh, will come to pass. So this tells us that investors and asset uh, owners are really evaluating the market, and that evaluation usually is a precursor to larger deals and portfolios trading, which is always good. So back to the, uh, the, the question, Kirsten, of what considerations are out there. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, you were wondering when I was gonna get there. Um, so again, it, it, it really, the, the, that baseline um, understanding and statement is really important to, uh, to understand the considerations, right? And why we're even talking about this. So, you know, the first thing any organization has to look at is how are they going to use their space? Um, and that really is um, a very personal decision for each organization. And they really need to understand, will they be largely dispersed workforce? Will they expect people back into the office at a certain point post COVID, post vaccine? Um, so there's a lot of really kind of deep seated questions you need to understand on the type of work your organization does and what that looks like in the future. And then based on that answer, you can really start to look at adjustments to your footprint. Can you shrink or be more efficient? Can you restructure your lease and save some capital? Um, th there's really a lot of uh, interesting opportunities that can happen. And the consideration on how you position your space going forward really is, is, is contingent on a lot of those factors. And the fact of the matter is office is not going away. Even in a highly distributed workforce, there is always a place for culture and collaboration and idea, and idea trading where people have to come together at least some of the time. So you really have to figure out how that's gonna impact. But from there, there's a lot of interesting opportunities. If you do have an opportunity to either renew a lease, sign a new lease or restructure your lease, um, a lot of times you can, you're, you're gonna want to um, do something in that space to welcome people back, right? Whether it's safety protocols, spacing, uh, different design, heavier collaboration spaces with less physical spaces, hoteling, whatever those, whatever that movement is for your organization, um, you can really do something interesting right now, which is you can renovate your current space while everyone's home. So if you want to stay where you are, if you love your location, you can renovate now in place straight time, no phasing, probably save yourself 30% net on your construction costs um, and allow people just to work from home and welcome them back with a beautiful new workplace. 
Um, you, you can also really take advantage of a very aggressive market today, right? So this is a huge consideration for uh, consultants and contractors who are looking to fill that pipeline, right? Right now, the uncertainty in the market is first half of 21, right? Um, so how do we fill that pipeline with brokerage uh, uh, revenues down, with the ability to show you can't cold call? All of these forces uh, are putting a strain on the pipeline that we all live off of. So that first half of 21 is really going to define how successful 21 will be. And then obviously how, how aggressively people will, will move back into the offices post vaccine. So what, the, what that yields, what that uncertainty is yielding is obviously a softening in the market, right? So we're seeing savings across the board on hard cost, soft cost furniture, a 10 to 12% on construction, uh, 15 to 18% on soft cost recently, um, and 10 to 12% on primarily furniture. But there's a big but here. Um, materials are not any cheaper. So that leads you to say, wait a second, if materials aren't cheaper and I'm seeing these savings, where is it coming from? The savings are coming from labor, overhead, and profit. So when you start to leverage labor, overhead, and profit, you have a, a minimization of what I think is the most important commodity in the world, and that is attention. So if you lose attention because you are moving through projects faster because you are so busy during the day, that speed equals mistakes. Mistakes yeah. equal costs and delays. So you've got to consider this. And again, this is a this is a, a reason why having a having a Sherpa or an advisor and a and a project manager um, really can help you through some of these really dangerous things that could happen right now. Um, so and there's some real real time examples. Is we're doing a a, a radio broadcast renovation right now. Um, for a very, very famous uh, uh, um, broadcast company, they are completely renovating their studios right now with everybody working from home so that when they can welcome people back, this will be a complete space. We're seeing building conversions uh, incorporating life science infrastructure into their repositioning, right? So there's real, real opportunities and pockets of, 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 uh, of uh, opportunity. And also there is a huge incentive program going on right now in Manhattan where there's $460 million a year earmarked to tax credits for sound, stu sound stages and broadcast studios. So there's an incredible push in, in lots of pockets of opportunity if you're ready to see them. Richard, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, um, you're actually leading right into my next question for, uh, for David, which I think is uh, sourcing strategies for these things specifically. So uh, David, what should occupiers and landlords consider uh, in determining their sourcing strategies given the current conditions uh, for designing construction services so that they can take advantage of that, but also be um, cognizant of those, of those risks? Uh, first say, uh... Great to see so many colleagues and industry friends on the call. Um, and it would be no surprise to the attendees uh, to reinforce what Richard has said about um, what's happened in the marketplace and the fact that across the architectural engineering and construction and furniture communities, there's <laughs> been a cliff, uh, a drop in um, business being booked. Um, and certainly uh, we don't know yet when that inflection point is going to occur uh, where the market returns to the buoyancy of January, February of, of this year. Um, so take it, taking advantage of uh, what I see as an accelerant of the the downslope um, where Richard's numbers are where the market is now, um, but will they get um, even more um, competitive in say nine months because the vaccine has taken too long to get distributed or for whatever reason. Um, so there's, there's a point in time, we're seeing that as uh, end of the first quarter is certainly when that um, point in time where the, the greatest uh, volume of um, bookable expertise is going to become available. Of course, there is that lag of projects that were being completed in 
2020 that'll just slip into the first few weeks of 21. Uh, okay. So what does that get for owners and occupiers? Um, this, this is gonna give you access to the best and the brightest of the market that um, where they had, you know, the AEC community had the choice of um, which projects to compete for. Now it's like a rugby scrum where mm -hmm. as soon as market knowledge um, occurs of a potential project, um, the inquiries from the entire community are, you know, omnipresent. Um, so that's the first thing is as an owner and occupier, the ability to um, uptick the people that you might have been thinking about um, as potential vendors, because A firm, B firm, C firm were typically higher priced or not uh, didn't have the A teams available. Um, rest assured, um, every one of those firms now have that availability. Um, and, and um, David, are there any are there any trends you're seeing in union versus open shop, or or other other trends you're seeing in sourcing uh, during this time? You you bring up a good point, which is, and I think Stephen mentioned this in the opening of having a robust and really diligent sourcing process from inception throughout the process and digging down to the next level of um, consultant and subcontractor and supplier to ensure that the due diligence and examination uh, pre-qualification of um, those types of firms is done throughout the process as well. So when we look at union versus open shop, um, obviously we're, and certainly in the occupier market, we're looking at what landlords will permit. We've done projects recently where we've actually had mixed um, union and open shop where landlords have slightly opened the door and have wanted to maintain those controls for the MEP um, and fire protection uh, subcontractors, but have opened the door a little bit to open shop um, firms who um, are robust enough to provide the management and experience to do um, the type of work that we do all the time. Um, and that's obviously also led to the reduction in cost because the union shops and union subcontractors are competing in a way that they never had to do before. Um, in, in, the, in the volume of landlords of A, you know, class A buildings mm -hmm. um, that are now allowing um, open shop subcontractors and contractors to work um, where they historically never did. Richard and, and Eric, are you seeing the same? Yeah, look, I think there's a there's an opening for any conversation at all <laughs> around anything because people are starved for uh, activity and action. So they're never going to turn away a, a tenant coming in and building an open shop uh, just because of a, of, of a labor harmony issue in most cases. Um, so, yeah, I think it's I think it's definitely open, Eric. Yeah, I would also say that, you know, it, history is repeating itself, right? In our last recession, uh, that, that, you know, the non-union or open shop side uh, picked up activity. Uh, so we're, we're simply seeing it again. And we, we actually had a question, which I think is, is a, a, we've had a perfect lead in here for uh, how the permitting process is going and how that may help or hinder um, the, the process and the speed at which construction can get done. Um, I know that we've talked about this as a panel uh, several times, but uh, Eric, do you want to do you want to address that question? Uh, the permit process is actually uh, fairly fluid. I, I think that, um, you know, now that, you know, for reasons that were just mentioned, um, there's not a lot of activity. Uh, it definitely was a bumpy road initially, uh, but I think that that process is, has cleaned itself up, you know, with exceptions to, you know, the, the, the fire department and, and what have you, and, and that those are 
the the typical cast of characters in a good day, right? So, um, but I think that uh, that has gone fairly smoothly. I remark that um, that's the case with a standard Department of Buildings permit process, um, especially where the landlord and your client has uh, selected a self-certification process, but the tertiary permits, Department of Environment and Trans Transportation in the city of New York are as, um, are lagging. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to be uh, uh, politically correct and say uh, they're lagging and leave it at that. And uh, um, the other thing is of course, the Department of Buildings is now um, accelerating the, um, change over from the uh, temporary certificate of occupancy to the interim certificate of occupancy, which should help landlords and occupiers uh, on those building sites that um, where that has been a problem historically um, or where you're uh, getting a change of use uh, for, you know, Alt-1 type projects. So, I would say, for the most part, green light, still yellow light for those specialty uh, approvals, you know, MTA, DOT, et cetera. I think we're all seeing the same thing there. Um, you know, we were talking about um, sourcing strategies, and I guess I'm wondering, you know, there's how people are sourcing things now because of the current conditions, but do you foresee any long-term changes to sourcing, things that people might continue to do even in the future? Uh, and maybe let's talk a little bit about the due diligence that we think is so important uh, in this process. Well, I certainly would say that you need to be, you need to have a much more robust and deeper due diligence pre-qualification process um, because um, the last nine months have decimated um, undercapitalized um, mm -hmm. firms um, and firms without deep benches of expertise, um, you know, because people have shed folks for on furloughs or rifts. Um, but um, the, the key to that is, of course, the due diligence and the pre-qualification uh, process. In terms of alternate sourcing methods, um, we've, you know, you know, it's certainly um, you're seeing it being utilized more and more, uh, especially on the smaller uh, projects where you have what I would call the design, manage, and construct single point of uh, contract um, methodology being used. Um, all of us have had to, as as owners, reps, project managers have seen where clients are looking to us to engage as principals. Um, and, I, and I expect that that and the design build market will continue to grow in the Metro New York region. Well, um, so Eric, um, given all of this, what, what kind of risks do you think need to be identified um, when you're, you know, specifically when you're proceeding with construction during this time? And and what um, mitigation plans do you recommend? Yeah, um, good question. The the uh, you know risk mitigation is certainly in the DNA of good project management. And while um, you know this is a great time to build, it doesn't come without risk, right? Uh, in this environment, um, I would actually point to you know some of what what uh, uh, David just mentioned, right? Is is really the subcontracting community. I think that's uh, that is uh, the, the big biggest exposure here, um, leading up to um, the when COVID hit in March. Um, uh, a lot of subcontractors were extremely busy, relying on cash flow, and were stretched very thin. Um, and, and some of it could be, you know, because of mismanagement. But the long and the short of it is, there will be fewer subcontractors in the months ahead. Right, and so that is definitely uh, an issue of concern because they are, you know, our industry is a supply chain industry, right? And 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 sub the subcontract community uh, controls a lot of that, right, for both labor and material. Um, 
And, and so, you know, having said that, I think this is an area where uh, project management can be extremely uh, valuable and effective um, in, in vetting that out, right? Um, uh, uh, reaching out to and, and, and getting in front of uh, manufacturers um, um, by way of example, um, that, that light fixture that was ordered for 10 weeks ago, you know, are, are we really gonna get it in 10 weeks time? Um, what, is the, what is the subcontractors uh, manpower and and um, workload and, and balance sheet and and this is certainly a due diligence that that um, a, a lot of the good contractors out there do um, but this is really a second set of eyes um, we have to cross our, our T's and dot our eyes in this environment and look you know the longer the project the bigger the, in terms of duration the the bigger the exposure right uh, shorter projects are are, are have uh, less are less vulnerable uh, in, in this environment. And also some of what uh, uh, David has talked about, right? Uh, the alternate uh, materials, right? Should, should um, um, Italy experience a, a spike by way of example, and you're gonna get uh, marble in Italy, you know, what, what, is, what is plan B, right? Uh, having the foresight to have an alternate plan because essentially once, once the ship has sailed and construction has started, Things like that delay projects, right? right. Um, and so that is that is a, certainly an area um, that that needs to be considered. And with that, I would also say, you know, the paperwork, um, the starting with the contract, um, evaluating uh, the contract and seeing what kinds of exposures are out there. Everyone is reconsidering, uh, looking at it with a different lens, right? Uh, issues of force majeure, by way of example, um, delays, construction delays, whether it's, you know, the contractor's um, uh, uh, fault or, or not, the kind of, most of the time it's not, right? Um, it, especially in this environment, it, the city puts a mandate, we all have to uh, react to it. So what does that mean uh, in terms of um, uh, the contract, right? How are delays or contract extensions or schedule extensions uh, dealt with? Is it is it a day per day uh, extension, and, and who pays for that? Right uh, under. I think it, a bunch of us got stuck in that on the on this last go round, right? Um, you know, we didn't see this coming. Now we can at least uh, foresee something like this, and in our in our leases or in our work letters, uh, account account for that. Yeah. Um, Extended. I have kind of a, an overlaying question. You know, in in most cases, not all, but in most cases we or our clients are not controlling down to the sub level. So what, um, you know, what strategies do you think, you know, we and our clients should, should utilize to ensure that we're financially protected if, you know, if a sub unfortunately does not survive uh, in the midst of a project? Uh, sub guard insurance, starting with that, right? Um, you know, that, that, that's, that's um, uh, certainly an avenue that, um, uh, uh, allows the project to move forward. Um, there's also bonding, of course, um, and that's certainly an option as well. Uh, that you know, I, I think also, you know, uh, there there needs to be some uh, a certain level of discipline in executing the projects, right? Um, documenting what was there, because when when you know when the construction process stops as a result of you know the city uh, putting a mandate out there. Um, the question is, how much work is in place? What did you buy uh, already? And th that's where the fun begins, right? But the paper trail leading up to that point is critical um, because that's where the finger pointing happens. So there needs to be a level of discipline around um, understanding what was or what was not done uh, leading up to that. And Chris, I think there's just two or three real kind of uh, relatively straightforward things that we've been, we've been implementing here. But I also think you got, you got, we have to take our minds off of just the contractors and the subcontractors, right? There's a whole lot of other people that come together, as we all know, on this call to bring a project to full uh, fruition. 
Um, so we have you have to make sure that as you are procuring, you're 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 also looking at the stability of of design uh, uh, entities and manufacturing entities. And when you spec a certain item, uh, you know, is that manufacturer uh, in in a, in, a, in a hot zone where that could get shut down from a scheduling standpoint? But um, what we do generally is a couple things. One is we put in our RFPs recently to general contractors. We ask them to document and identify their internal subcontractor validation um, uh, and vetting. Uh, and many of them have questionnaires and require uh, certain uh, submissions from their house trades to show that they've got cash on hand and everything else. So that's a, that's a right off the bat in an RFP, we do that for the GCs. We actually are just putting in place, we had a situation very recently, this week actually, um, where a, a, the, sub, the tertiary supplier to a subcontractor didn't pay and they leaned the job, not the trade, not the GC, but the third party, third down the line. So we're actually now asking for secondary lien waivers. And what I mean secondary is your primary is your general contractor and direct subcontractors, right? Everybody gets lien waivers to show that they have received that money and it absolves the client of any, of any um, uh, actions. But we are now gonna start asking for supplier lien waivers to make sure that they have gotten paid as well. Um, and we actually have a have language being drawn up and we're going to be doing an all hands call with all of our folks to get that put in place because we are starting to see failures as Eric had called out at not only the subcontractor level, but potentially at the supplier level. So just just, you know, you have to just go deeper. And then yeah. that's really the answer is just go deeper. And I think the other thing you know, that we've talked about amongst uh, our panel preparing for this is while there are a lot of um, there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, we should do the proper due diligence, but not always necessarily take the, the least expensive option. Um, you know, unfortunately, there are some some firms across the board, subs, uh, different uh, vendors and dealers who who won't survive this. Um, and you don't necessarily want to accept the price of a vendor who's so low that they're just trying to keep the lights on because you're 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 opening yourself up to huge exposure if if what you what you've provided to them doesn't actually keep the lights on and it's a delicate uh, situation um because you know we all want to see as many people stay in business as possible but you know our job is to protect our clients and you know i know a lot of uh a lot of my clients look at the they look at the bottom line first but you know we have to be prepared to talk to them about why that might not be the right uh, right solution for the for their project and Subguard is great, but at the end of the day, if you lose a sub, it that you lose some time getting somebody else caught up. So you want to try to avoid those situations. Um, I think we're going to go into Q and A in a couple minutes. Uh, I want to get one other thing, Kirsten, yep. which is it's not only at the uh, construction contractor, subcontractor due diligence, but it's at the consultants and for elements where the clients. Um, still have um, an MWBE requirement um, or goal, um, the due diligence now has to, you know, um, take another level of scrutiny because unfortunately, uh, those firms tend to be undercapitalized and under uh, resourced. Mm -hmm. So um, as, as, members of the owner's rep project management community, we are definitely advocates, but also the trusted advisor to clients to have them look at those situations and balance um, goal with reality, um, especially at this point in time. Well, and again, you know, real life examples. I, I met with my leadership team yesterday and we're updating our, our pre-qual questionnaire um, because we really want to capture, you know, the vendors that we work with across the board. How did they look in 2018 and 2019? And then what changed in 2020? And of course, we, we understand and fully expect that revenues have gone down a certain percentage and that maybe even headcount um, has been reduced. But it's a, it, you know, we want to track the trend and, and kind of be aware. And, and we're re-vetting all of our standard vendors um, going into 2021. Um, so I think that that's, you know, um, 
a practice that that people should should employ. Um, Eric, you want to uh, add some anything on on this conversation before I start throwing you guys uh, random questions that you're not prepared for? No, the the, the one other thing I was going to mention is that um, um, running job sites efficiently reduces risk, right? And I think that we're starting to see that um, on, uh, I, I certainly can appreciate that. You're starting to see that on some of the contractors that are out there um, that, uh, you know, have a focus around running the job more efficiently off, off-site construction, uh, whether or not they're doing assemblies, um, what have you. Uh, implementing, uh, there's it's certainly not new, but implementing pr principles around lean construction, which is really all about um, efficiency and, and uh, inventory and keeping man flow moving and uh, avoiding delays and what have you. So uh, I think good best practices on site um, really comes to light more now than ever before. And you're starting to see that, um, uh, you know, quite a bit on, on site. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, <clears throat> I have um, Alex Liz has a couple of really good questions. So I'm going to give her uh, an opportunity to unmute herself. And um, Alex, I, I think for me, one of the one of the great questions is uh, you have several. So I'm going to kind of prompt you um, about concessions. You want to ask that question to the panel? Yep. All right, I, I'll, I can ask it. Um, so, so Alex asked, are landlords providing tenants with more construction concessions? Uh, and I'll, I, I'll jump into, but um, you know, Richard, David. Yeah, look, I think, I think that there's a couple things going on and I heard an incredible stat about um, uh, cost per square foot on the retail side. And we you know, all know retail has, was on a decline even before COVID and accelerated that. Um, the I heard that that asking rents that were one time eleven hundred dollars a foot are down as low as four hundred and fifty dollars a foot. So what we're seeing on the office side is um, they're trying to maintain, and we see this in every cycle, every down cycle. They uh, landlords try to maintain their cost um, or their rent per square foot values and increase concessions exponentially. Uh, we are seeing incredible uh, concessions around. Um, tenant improvement allowances. Uh, they are, I mean, I'm seeing in uh, in class A and uh, class A minus and lower buildings concessions uh, packages of of, of of upwards of $125 a foot. Um, they are they're offering amenities, use of amenities for for uh, for free for the for the constituency and the tenancy. Um, so yes, we are seeing incredible uh, uh, amenity opportunity um, and concession opportunity, but we're also seeing private softening of that lease of those leased uh, values. So um, while they could publish $100 a square foot, you probably can get that space for 80 to 85 with a really great broker. Um, so they're on the surface, cost per square foot are holding steady, concessions are spiking. But as you get into and start trading paper, it softens a bit um, because landlords are looking to get people in their spaces. Yeah, I, I would totally agree um, and, and say that, you know, landlords are even offering to, you know, their willingness to build and, and package and do the whole design um, is, is escalating very quickly. Yeah, but, I, but I'll tell you, that's one of the considerations of the, okay, that are key for this panel is watch out for your landlord bills because they are they are, uh, we talked about the, the adjustments to labor and what they're allowing in the building versus open shop versus, uh, versus union. Um, they, they, will, they will go down a path that is the, of one of least resistance and, and generally a slightly lower quality. So just be careful, again, while you're engaging in a landlord build, there's, a, there's some risk there. It could be, look good on your financial uh, statement uh, year one, but could cause you major issues uh, operationally and from a cost standpoint going forward. And I, I think to, you know, you really have to have someone advocating for you, whether you're hiring the GC directly or it's the landlord. And if, if the landlord has a construction group themselves or if they're hiring the GC, there still has to be someone advocating for, for the tenant, for the occupier, um, because otherwise those things go to the crap. Well, as all, plus, as all of us know, right, uh, general contractors would love to take a dive on on values and then they love change orders. So, you gotta look at that as well. <laughs> I'll add uh, one thing, Kirsten, which is 
that where um, prospective tenant has great credit worthiness and where a building is not over leveraged, the TI um, and free rent periods are, are through the roof. We've seen a recent example where the TI was um, starting with a two, which um, this, the, the broker we were dealing with, which was not a Collier's broker, um, said in over 20 years in the business, they had never seen an offer like that. And I, I suspect that that's not an unusual occurrence, given, mm -hmm. again, great credit worthiness by the tenant, um, building that was not over leveraged. So the landlord can go to their financial backers and uh, leverage uh, their own financial credit worthiness uh, to provide deals that are unheard of or were unheard of. Yeah. Um, and so um, again, um, best time to build but and, and design, but be aware. Right, right. Um, I have another question here. Let's see, I've got a couple um, that look good. Um, Mindy, I think we answered your question in our, our conversation. Uh, Rob Finney, I think, is did I say it right? F-I-N-I. -I. Um, do you it's want Feeny. to? Feeny, sorry. Thank you. You want to jump in and, and uh, ask your question about building due diligence? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, with everybody working from home nowadays, uh, or working remotely anyway, just uh, distributed workforce, uh, the well, requirement for data connectivity to buildings is has in, uh, increased, I would imagine. The demand has gone through the roof. Uh, for a while, uh, there was a, a big splash made not too long ago about this wired building score. Uh, are you seeing any, when you're doing due, uh, due diligence for space, are you seeing any uh, increased demand amongst the tenants along those lines? Uh, and or are you seeing any activity from landlords and tenants to increase those scores and otherwise uh, add uh, boost connectivity to the buildings. So look, I, I think I think overall you, you, we're seeing a trend toward that. There's been a, t a tremendous amount of building repositionings and portfolio uh, analysis that have kind of been forced through this grand experiment. And uh, absolutely, in every one of those uh, uh, opportunities. Di digital connectivity and how that building performs on the grid is, is of, of, of incredible importance. Um, there, there are a lot of um, folks out there that are now coming in and doing the evaluations of buildings um, for their digital score, Rob, as you say. Um, but the, 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 I ha we haven't, I haven't seen a lot of folks jumping on it yet and doing infrastructure upgrades or doing data infrastructure upgrades yet in buildings other than in repositionings where that had to happen anyway. But I think you're going to see a push toward that as uh, people come back to the office and need that connectivity out on a much larger uh, video basis. Really, is what this is what the, what it comes down to. I think we're going to see that. But clearly, from a sector standpoint, data centers and uh, industrial are exploding, right? For obvious reasons, right? We're on we're on one of the platforms that's a reason for that, right? <laughs> so it's uh, that the needs of people in a distributed workforce are from an industrial and from a data center standpoint are uh, off the charts right now. Yeah, I think you know you're you're definitely you know that that is if you're in the market, um, that's definitely one of your requirements, right? It, it's now added to the list um, in, in terms of infrastructure in general. Um, and so it's going to be incumbent upon um, to, to address that. I think uh, Richard's right. You know, we're not seeing it full force right now, but you know it's coming. Um, and, and also the reality is, is that a building's connectivity, you know, given the fact that, you know, what we've learned uh, as a result of COVID is you can work from home, right? And at the end of the day, there's, there's going to be a hybrid model, right? Uh, and we've seen this published all over the place, right? So for landlords to have connectivity with their tenants and, and information and transparency, it's gonna be extremely important. Um, it's part of the cell. It is now part of the cell for sure. Yeah. 
Um, Jim Donahue, do you want to ask your uh, your question, or I'm happy to ask it. I can't see where everybody is on the on the screen. No, you could you could go ahead. Uh, just just read that away. It's pretty self explanatory. Thank you, though. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so Jim's asking: Is a, a slowdown in work a good time for the industry to evolve from the traditional design, bid, build, uh, and utilize more design, build, or assist partnering uh, with CMs and subs to save time? cost, uh, improve quality of CDs, and, and I will add on to this, um, and then also confirmation of uh, the availability of materials in the process, instead of waiting until you've already designed something in. Anybody yeah. wanna jump on that one? I mean, look, it's a, it's, a, it's a really good really good point that the fact of the matter is we have all been forced to evolve, but that evolution has not been focused on the construction and design industry, right? It's been, it's been largely about how do you manage a distributed workforce? Is it sustainable? How do we get past this, this uh, kind of immediate uh, mountain we're trying to climb? Um, but I think Jim and, and, and everyone else, every time a challenge is posed to society at large, there is a push toward innovation and change. So I think the answer is yes. I don't know if the New York marketplace or the, 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 the national marketplace as a whole can get to design build at this moment because that is such a sea shift in contracts and, and legal precedent and ownership and, and liability here. It's not the same as in Europe where that's very prevalent. Um, but I think we'll see some version of design build that is a little bit less everything under one roof and a, a partnering of firms uh, repeatedly at set price structures to implement work. I, I think there's a hybrid of it. I just don't know it, with the challenges ahead of us on all the other corporate fronts that design build would come out of this specific problem. I just recently, um, actually a couple of days ago, posted something on, on LinkedIn um, with regards to technology. I know whether or not it's big bill at the end of the day, I'm not really sure when that, uh, when and if that will come, but, but technology is absolutely going to play a bigger role in our industry. Um, I think uh, never before, has that, you know, um, have we seen such a need for, for technology to, to, to play in this, in this space? Um, how, how projects are planned, um, uh, how they're constructed. I had mentioned before, offsite construction, assembling, um, things like that, um, uh, automation um, that's uh, now being available. I think you're gonna see a trend around that area, that part of the industry, um, uh, very strong. I'll uh, repeat what I said earlier, um, but um, also point out that with the growth in certainly in New York State of the PPP and the design build model and the effect that that will have on the amount of capital project money going through the system with architects, engineers, and contractors, <clears throat> and uh, you know the, the lagging outcome of legal disputes to those models in New York metro area, um, I think will have a longer term impact to the use of those types of models, even for corporate uh, interior um, projects. It's not unusual for um, certain um, market sectors to use that model um, outside of New York. And I, I just see that, you know, if you took a snapshot today and a snapshot in 2025, you would see that design, manage, construct, design, build will have a much greater uh, percentage of the market by the time <clears throat> that rolls around. So a uh, somewhat related question, um, but uh, as far as, as designing in improvements, uh, are, are you guys seeing, and, and I'll answer this question as well, are you seeing COVID HVAC infrastructure upgrades on interiors projects? Um, I think we're all gonna nod. Um, I have a lease being signed today, which was supposed to be signed about three weeks ago. 
but at the very end, we got into a, what are the filters on the existing units? We want them upgraded. We want more air, even though we had three engineers say that the amount of the tonnage of air conditioning that was being proposed was more than sufficient. They wanted more air um, and everything had to be MERV 13. They were not satisfied with MERV 11. The existing units are gonna have to be upgraded. So we took another three weeks to negotiate all of that. And the, the tenant is even absorbing some of the cost because they know that they're asking for uh, something that's above and beyond standard. Um, so I, I don't know if any of you want to chime in, but I, I think the answer is yes. Yeah, no, look, the, certainly this is part of the sell, right? The employee, employers need to get employees back, right? And they have to package this and make people feel safe. And so, you know, when I was referring to the checklist, this is certainly one of those things that, you know, this low hanging fruit put in, put in a filter, but, but those are that, that bar has now just uh, been raised and others will follow. Yeah. Yeah. And look, what we, what we're doing and working with brokers is that a lot of, we've actually developed a, a kind of a questionnaire to landlords when we start trading paper is what upgrades have you done to the infrastructure and even the common area of protections of the spaces um uh to 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 enhance building safety and it goes everything from cleaning to the distancing to the directional arrows to filtration and then it goes even at further where there's a lot of new technologies out there like uh like um um the uh the uv light treatment uh in ductwork as well as the um the ionic uh uh free radical approach to flooding the air and changing the composition of any allergens or viruses in the air. So there's a lot of interesting stuff out there. Um, science is not fully baked on a lot of it, but uh, you, you are well within your rights. And frankly, you should get assurances from your landlord uh, as well as your employer uh, as to what they are doing to keep you safe in the workplace. Yeah. I'll also state that um, one of the items that has not yet been fully examined and resolved is uh, that balance with future landlords of um, demanding uh, a healthier um, building and tenant space with in New York City, the requirements for local law 97 to reduce carbon footprint. So right. um, there's going to be uh, that examination and um, owners reps, project managers, landlords and tenants are going to have to, uh, you know, do a deeper dive on uh, not only the ask upfront about a healthier environment, but the long term outcome of energy use to achieve that. So our engineering colleagues are going to be uh, put to work, come up with um, what I would call more efficient solutions that provide a win-win, right? Healthy environment and right. uh, efficient um, utilization of energy. So we're we're actually down to our our last five minutes. In the beginning, I was afraid we weren't going to have enough questions. Now we have some that uh, we probably won't get to, um, but. Um, I, I did want to just ask not to put anyone too much on the spot from the end users who are on the call. Um, hopefully we have several. I, I mean, I know we have several, but we have 91 people right now, so I'm not scrolling through the whole list. Um, would any of you like to offer uh, when you are returning to the office, if you're not already, um, when you plan to do that? I think uh, Allison is out there. Sure. She's yeah, I can, I can respond um, on behalf of Deutsche Bank. So the... Um, for us, the bank made a decision, um, given that we're building out our new headquarters at Columbus Circle, which will be open July of next year. We made the decision to um, allow staff to come back if they, if they want to come back. Of course, there are some staff that have to be in from a regulatory perspective, but um, we, we really left it up to staff feeling comfortable uh, with their own personal safety and situations. And, um, if not, then, uh, we've kind of closed the door for now and told them to come back when our headquarters is ready. So from that perspective, I, a vast, vast majority have, of staff have decided to stay home, myself included. Um, and we are actually, you know, 
able to get ahead of the project because we have less people in the building to decommission and uh, it's making the move much easier as we get into the headquarters. Great, thank, thank you so much, Allison. Um, is, would anybody else, uh, Raj, you, you, you said you're willing to jump in. I'd love to hear what you're... Yeah, uh, well, for Marsha McLennan, uh, we are um, allowing staff uh, full access to the space and the ability to work uh, in the office, but there's no push, there's no active drive to have colleagues come in. So in our Midtown headquarters, uh, about uh, 30, 3,700, uh, sorry, 3,300 colleagues, we're seeing about 5% attendance right now. And kind of anticipate that, you know, just kind of being the status quo moving forward. Is anyone, uh, any end you I know, I know we have three minutes left, but I'm just curious, are any of the end users, are you fully open? And ha does anybody actually have a, you know, I guess what would be considered a full office today would be roughly, I think, about 25%. Anybody? Well, I'm not an end user. Other than contractors and people in our industry who are all. Yeah, I'll mute. <laughs> We're back. You tell me. <laughs> um, sorry, just kidding you. Um, so, oh, hey, Kirsten, I'm yeah. sorry for Alex. This is Alex Liz from Lazard. I would say we're we're probably trending with Raj as well. Where while our doors are open, we're not having any client meetings. Our you know our users just don't want to really want to come in, right? We have about five percent from uh, two thousand employees that are in New York, so we're not going to push it anymore. It's a matter of feeling comfortable at this point. So we may, which we're, we're expecting to see an uptick Q2 right up next year or so. Great, thank you. I would just have a question uh, with regards to that. Is it, would you say it is the office itself, the commute, the building, or is it all of the above? Yeah, I, I mean, I can I, jump from my office. Uh, Alex, go ahead, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, I would say for us, the biggest factor has been the commute in. I think that for the most part, with the exception of the younger demographics who live in the city on a walking distance, the majority of folks, you know, have to catch a public train and they're just, you know, um, risk adverse. They prefer to just work from home if they can. Right. Ours as well, exactly the same. <clears throat> Great, thank you. So what's interesting is we all, we are all focused on the uh, building environment. And the fact of the matter is in New York City, specifically because we are less car driven, um, the, the, the only unsafe part of your day, if your building is safe, is how you get in and out of work. Um, so it is, a, it is a definite factor. I have actually been taking the train. Um, it's, I'm largely alone <laughs> um, and masked, uh, but I, 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 I have a higher uh, fear tolerance than most. So I've been, I've been enjoying the empty trains. <laughs> yeah, I've been on the subway, so I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. Um, I know we're at our time limit and we um, we are, I see some people are dropping off. Um, I'm, I'm glad the questions picked up. I'd like to uh, thank our panelists. Thank you, David, Eric, and Richard. Thank you, Tommy and Stephen. Um, I hope this has been informative for everyone. It has been informative, so I believe we'll send out, uh, uh, after we clean it up and get the jibber jabber in the beginning, uh, cut out, we'll, uh, we'll get this distributed to folks. Stephen or Tommy, do you want to say anything in, in closing? Uh, no, that's great. I think we're out of time. Just um, reiterate the, the message, really. It's a great opportunity. You just need to manage it through the process. Yes. And, yes. and thanks all on behalf of the chapter. Uh, we did do that poll. So if you'd like to connect with any of the panelists, uh, they'll be given that information if you clicked on that. We have our uh, chapter volunteer uh, awards tomorrow night and the annual meeting. So for any chapter members that want to join, please do. But uh, I, on behalf of the chapter, to all the panelists and to Stephen and your committee for pulling this together, thank you very much. This has been great. Uh, speak to you all soon, hopefully in person. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you for Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.